<clears throat> so objects obviously can perform operations on behalf of other objects, and the operations are invoked by messages received from other objects. So essentially, when you have a method call, roughly it could represent uh, at your design stages a message coming in that uh, basically makes this uh, object do something. All right, so this essentially you can view the entire system as being um, a set of objects if these boxes represent particular objects. And essentially you have, uh, they interact with another by sending each other messages, right? So the message, the message could be sent from here to here and then you can wait for it to come back with some result. And with the one particular result, you can uh, even call back again and interrogate another object for more information or make it do uh, more stuff, right? So this is essentially the theory of object-oriented design that essentially um, you don't just keep uh, data as global shared by the entire system. Instead, individual objects protect the information and in order to uh, find that information, uh, objects have to call each other and interact with one another, right? So uh, that is, uh, you know, the the uh, the idea uh, the of the object-oriented design principle. So let's just see what uh, else on the plate in this specific uh, in this specific. Uh, Mm, uh, presentation. Uh, object identity. So identity is important. The, first of all, you know, if you have a database record, uh, you want to be able to, uh, for that record to be preserved, saved. Uh, generally speaking, we want that record in the database to persist, but it would be desirable to identify that record by some kind of unique identity. Um, and that unique identity usually could be just a simple uh, unique numerical value, like a unique sequence number in the, in the set of records, uh, for instance. Or it could be more complicated uh, identity, which is combined out of like, you know, someone's phone number, um, their, uh, their date of birth, and other combination of parameters, right? Uh, so, um, so in, in, if, we, um, uh, if we think about one of the obvious things, such as like naming your object, uh, uh, then if you, can, if you think about it, naming of your object is not um, uh, very specific. For instance, um, if you have, uh, let me think about this uh, for a second. Uh, Um, if, for example, uh, if, for example, we have um, a property uh, property owner, right, a class, and inside this class we have uh, the name of this property owner, and in Java world, uh, inside here, what we can have is that, of course, the name is most likely, the type of the name is a string, okay? So the type of this name is a string, and what it means is that basically somewhere else, uh, a string object, so when the property owner object is instantiated at runtime and it exists here, it essentially holds the reference to the string, okay? So it holds the reference to the, to the string, and so this is our property uh, owner uh, uh, instance uh, of an object. And this is an instance of a string which holds the name uh, of this property owner. Okay? So, but then this reference is not unique. So right here it is called name, right? But if I want to pass this name to, uh, to other part of the system, basically it can be called something else in a different part of the system. Um, uh, it could be simply called X over here. But it still refers to the same object, right, to the same instance of the string if this was passed to uh, some other part of the system right here. So uh, therefore, the names, the initial names we give to object references um, are not uh, specific uh, uh, identities of that object, right? So we can pass a reference to object to any method, 
and it can make use of it, like make, starting making calls um, to, to that other object. But the actual name of the object reference is not unique. Uh, it can be different in different parts of the system. So generally speaking, variable names are not viewed to be object identities. What object identity is specifically in Java is uh, perhaps we can refer to, um, uh, the, for instance, in, in Java, uh, maybe I could actually start my uh, NetBeans um, here and uh, maybe try to uh, demonstrate uh, maybe uh, a possible uh, versions of uh, identity. Okay, so let me get started with this and maybe I can just go and f say file new project, just create a project from scratch. Okay, and we can say that this is our um, uh, week uh, week three uh, demo, maybe. Um, right, so that looks good. And I will create the main class, main app right here to simplify mm, coding it. Right? And so if I um, <clears throat> if I think about um, uh, specific Java application, uh, what uh, may be viewed as unique about uh, objects in Java, for instance, if I wanted to have um, uh, property uh, owner uh, class and say owner, right? So this is a variable name. Um, and then create it as new property owner right here in my real estate application or something like that. And uh, uh, maybe constructor wants to um, to get a first name or, or nickname of uh, of that specific uh, property owner. All right. So um, so let me create this class property owner. I right, just go to my project. Uh, go to my uh, package and say I want to have new Java class name like this, uh, right? So that creates me a separate class. <clears throat> and this would be my property owner class right here. So if you do your... Um, uh, Google search for Java object uh, class, okay? Uh, so Java object class and jump to the official documentation for Java object class. Um, uh, what's, um, uh, what's available in its uh, uh, interface is uh, the hash code, right? So if you read this documentation for Java hash code, which returns an integer, you will see that um, uh, the hash code is actually designed to provide identities to individual instances of objects, right? So for example, if I create um, mm, multiple instances of the property owner in my application, right? Um, let me see if I can actually, right, so this would be owner one and owner, owner two in my application. Then I can try something like this, system, system dot out dot print, uh, print line, right, and I can say uh, owner one, uh, owner one, um, uh, get uh, uh, get name, right? Get name plus space um, owner one 
um, and use this uh, hash code uh, to display. Okay, and I'll do it with both of my objects, owner one and owner two. Of course, what I need at this point is um, just rearrange this. Okay, looks fine. Right, so the property owner needs a constructor. So my data will be string, uh, string uh, name uh, right here, and I will probably want to keep it private. Right, and my uh, constructor, constructors here, my constructor uh, will be public. Right, and so it wants to take the uh, the string uh, name, and I would like to store that name right here. This name equals the name that was given to the constructor. Okay, um, and so this is my constructor of the object, and then uh, in terms of the operations. Uh, I can ask my environment to actually give me um, insert code and say that I want the getter and setter for the name generate. Okay, perfect. So it generates basically set name uh, method right here and the get name uh, which I want to use in my uh, main application. Right. So we typically make sure that we position these under the operations, so that's very typical design. Right, so we have the constructor, we have some data, we have some getters and setters, which are very basic type of methods, which simply either return information or change the information. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this is my property owner thing right now and so like I said I wanted to check what these hash codes are when I run this application so hopefully this is simple enough for me to just simply execute this application and um, uh, what uh, Java documentation says um, about this um, uh, about this um, let me just actually resize this a little bit Let's see. 